Hi, this is Jim Janesey, and these are the lecture slides for Chapter 6 of the Gombrich textbook, The Story of Art. In this chapter, we're going to be taking a look at the Roman Empire in two parts. Rome, centered on that city, and Byzantium, centered on the city of Constantinople, sometimes known as Istanbul. We'll be looking at roughly the time period 500 to 1300, more of this is centered in the time period 500 to 1000. Let's take a look at this map. This is a map of the entire world as we know it to be now, all the continents represented. But what I've shown here in the darkened colors, in this area here, is the world as it was known to ancients and to people in the time period we're looking at. The red lines here separate this area into roughly Europe, Asia, and the Middle East and Africa. And these lines are drawn pretty much to represent the divisions of those areas. So Europe is primarily the area that we talk about as the Roman Empire, although the Roman Empire did extend around the Mediterranean. Asia, or the Orient, includes being east of this area, and generally everything south of it and east of it would be regarded as the Middle East or Africa. Here's another way of looking at things. I've drawn on here some shapes to represent the different areas that we've talked about. Egypt, here, the Fertile Crescent, Greece, and the city of Rome. You see all of these are centered around the Mediterranean. Let's take a look in this bullet point way of a couple of things. The Roman Republic founded 750 BC the form of government changed to be that of an empire with a dictator and an emperor about 63 BC. Emperors thought of themselves as deities. They eventually were worshipped after their death and it came to be the fact that some of them felt they were deities even in life. Jesus lived in this time period after the Roman Republic had become an empire and the Gospels and the New Testament were composed about 20 years to 70 years after Jesus lived. During this time period, Rome destroyed Jerusalem. It had controlled the area for more than 100 years by that time. The Jews were rebellious, and much as Jesus had predicted, the temple was destroyed, utterly destroyed, and today only rocks remain of what was the temple, and it's scattered over the ground surrounding the temple. And we'll see in the next unit how during the Moslem era, several hundred years after this destruction, the Moslems took over that whole temple mount, and there's a mosque on top of it now, as well as the Dome of the Rock, another very important Moslem monument. Christian persecutions began shortly after Jesus' crucifixion. The Emperor Nero was quite famous for torturing Christians, and some of the Roman emperors after his time, until 312, when the whole Roman Empire became Christian, some of the emperors between this period of time were worse than others in terms of persecuting religions that were not recognized as being valid by the Roman government. Rome became Christian in this year due to the edict issued by the Emperor Constantine in 312. And we'll look at that event in another chapter as well. It begins the time of much development of art for a very specific purpose, the telling of religious stories in as simple a way as possible. This event of Rome becoming Christian changed places of worship. Pagan celebrations typically occurred outdoors, but Christian church services would occur inside. Meeting halls were called basilicas, and we'll see how the earliest churches were large meeting halls patterned on those used for the civil government. When Rome fell, it was the end of a process of disintegration. Rome had overextended itself, and various invaders, called Vandals and Goths, which leads to two interesting words, Vandalism and the Gothic era. Generally, in the 5th century at about this time when Rome fell, is regarded as the end of the Roman Empire. There were emperors up until this time with a diminishing amount of area that they controlled. This event of Rome falling led to what was later called by many the Dark Ages. It wasn't that the people who lived during that time saw the times as particularly 
dark. It wasn't a continuous eclipse during that period. It's dark because much of the civilization and the learning that had been acquired and built up by the Greeks and the Romans in prior times was lost. Due to these disruptions of invasions of Europe, many of the skills that the Romans had possessed in building and the knowledge of the ancients were just lost because the disruptions in the lives of people meant that there wasn't anybody to carry on the process of copying materials on which learning was recorded. And as those materials were destroyed or fell apart on their own, knowledge was lost. Well, we've seen several different purposes for images among other historical civilizations. What grew up during this period, when the church replaced the Roman government as an institution that carried forth on culture, was this idea that images are foretelling religious stories. Pope Gregory the Great said it this way, for those who can't read, pictures serve as the things that tell the stories just as words serve that purpose for those people who can read. Let's take a look at a basilica, an early church in the 6th century. This is a meeting hall. You see here a vast area enclosed leading to an altar and a domed end of it here that we see decorated just barely with some faces of individuals. These arches here support the walls, but there are side wings here for even more people to be present when the priest celebrates the Mass, which occurs at this altar here. So the church service centered on this altar and the ritual performed by a priest. The decoration in churches usually consisted of something like this in response to that dictate of Pope Gregory. And you see this occurred even before Pope Gregory's edict in the late 500s, and it shows this idea of telling a religious story or reminding the viewer of some religious event that they probably had heard about and not read about themselves. This is the biblical story of Jesus feeding the crowd of thousands of people with only a few loaves and only a few fishes. Jesus is dressed in purple, which was the color of the royalty in the Roman Empire. So Jesus is clothed in this same way. His apostles that are handing him the bread and handing him the fish are doing it with their hands covered up, so their hands don't touch these objects. And that's typical of that period, the way a common person would hand something to the emperor. The common person's hands wouldn't touch the object or stand any chance of touching the emperor's hand. Take a look at the artistry involved here. The background here is very flat. There's no attempt here to portray a real landscape, although some tiny bit of depth is hinted at by these plants on the sides that are slightly behind where the apostles and Jesus are standing. A lot of artistry has gone into this to attempt to illustrate these folds of the cloth, though some elements of what the Greeks had learned about representing the human form are present here, perhaps as much as you could expect in a mosaic. Take a look at the what these people are all doing. Now their eyes are sort of to the side, some of them straight ahead, but basically they're all looking at you. The idea here is that this imparts the notion that you are being observed even when there are no other people around. Jesus as a representative of God is looking at you. So what you're doing is known. The same gaze here of the apostles carries that same idea. So they're not looking at one another, they're all looking at you. This is the feeling that was intended to be given to people who were in this large hall and seeing this sort of picture in the decoration of the church.